Did you ever visit the zoo? Suki did. Did you ever watch the peacocks at the zoo? Suki did. Did you ever hear the peacocks shout, Help! 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 Suki did. That was how Suki decided a peacock was beside her as she stood at the corner waiting for the traffic light to turn green. She couldn't see a peacock, but she was sure she could hear, Help! 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 And it sounded exactly like the peacock she had watched at the zoo. Even though she couldn't see him, she felt sorry for him and said, What is the matter? Why are you crying help? Because I cannot cross this wide, busy street alone, said an oldish, raspish voice. The traffic light turned green. In that instant, Suki swooped up the invisible peacock in her arms and hurried across the street. As she carefully set him down, she thought, I must be dreaming. I feel so foolish. I do hope no one is watching. No one is, said the peacock, as though Suki had spoken her thoughts aloud. How did you know what I was thinking? Well, I do not want you to think I am bragging, but I am very, very wise. He said this so naturally and so humbly that Suki imagined him to be the very wisest, and the very kindest creature in all the world. From this moment, she would trust him with all her thoughts and dreams and secret wishes. They walked side by side, Suki's feet scarcely touching the ground. At last, Suki had found a best friend. Six hours later, Suki hurried through the huge double doors of the Louisa May Alcott School into the spring sunlight. Six hours had never lasted so long. The clock had never been so pokey. Suki had tried her best to listen to the teacher. She had tried her best to study in the library, but the truth was she had not heard one word. She had not read one word. The invisible peacock was the only thing she could think about. Would he be waiting now? He had promised to meet her by the new maple tree, the one her class had planted. Was he there? Or had she imagined their walk to school that morning? Maybe she had not really heard him cry, Help! 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 After all. Mother was always saying, Suki, your imagination is running away with you again. And her two older sisters would say, Suki, you're just making that up. Once when her daddy had overheard them, he said slowly and softly, Imagination is the beginning of faith. I want you to have faith when you grow up, Suki. She could not guess what all that meant, but the way daddy looked at her told her imagination was a good thing to have. It can play tricks on you, though, she said right out loud. Not this time. It was the invisible peacock. Suki was sure she heard him say, Not this time. He was already beside her going down the school steps. He had kept his promise like a best friend always does. Didn't you think I would come? asked the invisible peacock. Yes and no, Suki replied, smiling. Mostly yes. At that moment, the big kid they all called Butch shoved Suki from behind. Then as he leaped down the steps, he yelled, Slant Eyes is talking to herself again. Dozens of girls and boys were coming out the school doors now, shouting and teasing, chasing past like jets. But Suki was watching Butch disappear. She made a face and muttered, I hate him. I hate him. That was how she forgot all the lovely things she had thought up to tell her best friend. Instead, she began telling him about Butch. She was all wound up. She talked faster and faster. Butch was a pest. He simply would not leave her alone. He tripped her at recess. 
He stole a bouquet of daisies she had brought for Miss Kelly and tore them up petal by petal. He stepped on her clean sneakers. He wrote his name in bright green ink all over her English workbook. And every time he got caught doing something he knew he shouldn't do, he would blame the other kids. But worse than that, he had to tell on everybody. Butch was a mean old tattletale. The invisible peacock thought Suki would never have finished the list if she hadn't run out of breath. Hmm. Tattling is pretty serious, he said. But have you never told on your sisters? Suki stopped stock still, and her face turned red all over. Well, just once, and I'm still sorry. You would have to know about that. <laughs> oh, it doesn't change anything. I love you just the same. I even love Butch. You love Butch? Suki would have to think that over carefully. Her best friend even loved Butch. Nothing more was said as they walked the long block to the very corner where they had met the first time. Could that have been only this morning? This time there was no waiting for the traffic light. It winked green, and the two friends crossed the wide, busy street quickly. I must go home now. My mother and daddy will be watching for me, Suki told the invisible peacock. What will you do? I'd better get back to the zoo. You don't like it there, do you? Let's say I like the jungle better. Jungle? What jungle? One of Suki's favorite books was about a boy who lived and hunted in a jungle. What jungle? Oh, the very densest, greenest jungle in all of India. India? But that's so far, far away. You must be homesick. Uh, some days are harder than others. India is a very large place, and my jungle was always warm and full of flowers. The yard at the zoo is a little crowded, and it gets pretty chilly when the wind blows off the lake. Suki couldn't bear for her best friend to be lonely in the strange city zoo. You must come home with me. I live in this street half a block north, and downstairs is my daddy's gift shop. Upstairs is our home. In the backyard is a beautiful paradise tree. Until I met you, it was my best friend. One branch has grown as high as my bedroom window. A month from now, the leaves will be so thick I can lean out of my window and touch them. You can stay there. It will be your very own place, and I will be close by. We will be together. Oh, thank you. I will be honored to come. And the invisible peacock spoke as though he had just been invited to the grand oh, he had just been invited to the grandest palace by his favorite princess. As they arrived at her father's gift shop, the little girl stooped down and said, My name is Suki. Say it. Suki, the peacock whispered. And I will call you best friend. Don't forget. Her hand turned the cool, smooth knob, and the familiar door opened. A little bell tinkled as Suki and the invisible peacock stepped inside. The Gosho gift shop was one narrow room, softly lit. Every inch of space on the shelves was filled. Earth, brown, pottery teapots, porcelain vases and bowls, bronze figurines, lacquered trays and nests of boxes, baskets of wrapping papers, green and gold, pink and purple. Long and short and middle-sized back scratchers carved from ivory hung on tasseled scarlet cords. From the rear of the shop, a small man walked toward Suki. His face was as round as a narcissus bulb. Only his eyes smiled, and he hugged Suki with pleasure. Daddy, I brought along my best friend. He is an invisible peacock I met on the way to school. Her father did not so much as blink. A peacock you met on the way to school? Interesting. Where did he come from, Suki? 
Oh, from a jungle in India, a jungle full of flowers. But lately has been staying at the zoo, and Daddy, you know how crowded and bare it is. May we let him stay in our paradise tree, please? At least for the summer? Well, certainly, Daddy said at once. Tell your friend we are honored to have him. Did you hear that, best friend? Suki clapped her hands. Oh, you are the most bestest daddy in all the world, Suki cried, almost smothering him in a storm of pats and kisses. They laughed so loudly that Mother came to see what was going on. Have you two wrinkled sillies gone out of your minds? Her voice was sharp, but her black eyes danced. She liked for Suki and Daddy to play their games. She liked for them to laugh. It brought the quiet little shop to life, and it made her heart all warm and happy. Mother, guess what? My best friend has come home with me to stay. Daddy says he can. Uh, what best friend is this, Suki? Another stray dog or cat? You know we haven't room. No, Mother, he isn't a dog. He isn't a cat. He's an invisible peacock, and he's going to stay in our paradise tree. An invisible peacock? Mother winked at Daddy. Suki, your imagination is running away with you again. Daddy looked almost as disappointed as Suki did, but he kept a smile in his voice as he said, Some things are real, even if we can't see them. He looked at the silver watch on his wrist, then at the pretty blue clock on the wall. Say, my watch is slow again. I didn't know it was almost time to close the shop. Suki looked at the clock on the wall, too. Its face was flat and white, framed in the pretty blue. The short black hand pointed to five. The long hand was still an inch away from twelve. Now Daddy would roll up the scalloped yellow awning. Her sisters would come home from their swimming lessons. The front door would be bolted, the safe locked up. The Gosho gift shop would wait silently through the long night. The invisible peacock followed Suki into the back hall, which was still bright with afternoon sun. Mother was going up the stairs. Come inside soon, Suki. We'll have an early supper. Daddy has to go to the Park West neighborhood meeting. All right, Mother, Suki called as she ran out the door. The yard was as long and narrow as the shop. A gravel path wound among low evergreens and flowering bushes to the tall back fence. And close to the house was the paradise tree. The invisible peacock spotted it at once. This is it, best friend. What do you think of it? I think it is the loveliest tree I have ever seen, Suki. And believe me, that's saying something. He could see that the sapling tree had grown crooked and low to the earth. Now the old trunk curved gradually skyward to where the branches reached. They were heavy with buds. Spring rains and sun would push out the spear-shaped leaves, and a patch of cool, cool shade would spread over the ground below. Yes, the peacock could see it all. He could feel the shade. You wouldn't guess it, Suki, but this tree and I have something in common. It lost its leaves late last summer, didn't it? Yes, and I got so tired of raking. Well, I lost the feathers in my train at about the same time. You did? Did that hurt very much? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. We peacocks always lose our longest feathers then, the ones that project beyond my tail. But new ones replace them. The way the tree gets brand new leaves? Exactly. Do tell me more about yourself, best friend. Suki perched herself on a large flat rock under the paradise tree, and the invisible peacock hopped up beside her. How long will it take to grow your fan again? Is that what you call it, a fan? How long will the feathers be, and what color? Uh, hold on a minute. If everything turns out all right, my train will be six feet long by next Christmas. Six feet? Feet long? Why, that's 72 inches. Exactly. You notice I call it my train. Now, some peacocks call it their halo. 
Scientists call it a notch. You call it a fan. No matter what it is called, it is forever giving me trouble. The peacock shook his feathers. This talk made him uncomfortable, and he began to pace up and down in front of Suki. She couldn't see his eyes. He turned his head away, but she did hear a sadness in his voice when he said slowly, I've never told anyone this before, but I can tell you, I wish my fan would never grow back. What a terrible thing to say, best friend. Oh, I've never seen anything so beautiful as a peacock with his feathers spread. Uh, that's just the point. Day after day, people came to visit our yard at the zoo, and whether they were three years old or 80, they all said the very same thing. They would walk up close to my fence and say, Come on, spread your tail. Every single one of them said it. Come on, spread your tail. So I always did to please them. No, it's tricky to balance a huge fan of feathers like that when you spread it out as far as it will go, and you have to lift your feet high and gallantly to keep from falling on your face. Oh, they would say, isn't that gorgeous? They would say that all right, but then I would hear them add, what a vain bird he must be. Look at him strut. Look at him strut. Thinks he's something proud as a peacock. Ha! They said it every time, Suki, every time. And they laughed. It made me want to disappear. I prayed the earth would open up and swallow me. That's why I became invisible. Suki put out her hand to touch best friend. She stroked the fine feathers on his neck and whispered, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Those people were cruel. And what you have told me has just made me love you more. And I know you are not beautiful only when you spread your tail. You're beautiful on the inside all the time. And you're not proud. You're humble, truly humble. I know. Best friend, you are going to stay with me. And that tree there is your very own home. And you won't have to show anyone your fan if you don't want to. Not ever. The lovely moment was shattered by the squeak of the screen door. Mother stood there tying on her apron. Suki, your sisters have come. Get ready for supper now. Goodbye for a little while, Suki said to the peacock. I'll bring you something to eat. Watch for me. That's my window, the one closest to the top of the tree. It won't be long. Best friend saw Suki disappear inside the house. Then he pecked curiously at the gravel and swallowed a few grains of sand. Hmm. For the first time in weeks, I, I believe I'm hungry, he mused. It will soon be dark. I wonder if I can make it up to that limb outside her window. He started walking up the curved trunk of the paradise tree. The first limb was close to the second. He flew straight up and then to the next. And the next, huh, 30 feet at least, exclaimed the invisible peacock looking down to the ground. My, I haven't been this high since I was a peabody in the jungle. He cautiously edged out onto the swaying limb until he was opposite Suki's window and with perfect balance settled himself to wait. With her fork, Suki drew flowers and fancy doodles on the soft white tablecloth, then erased them with one magic stroke. She had not listened to the conversation at the supper table, but she knew her sisters had done most of the talking. You would think no one ever took swimming lessons before. The words had swirled around her and the faces above the steaming plates bobbed and blurred while she dreamed of a tropical jungle far away, swarming with color Birds, insects, flowers, snakes, furry animals, scaly animals. Suki, you haven't touched your fruit. Mother's voice startled her, so she dropped her fork and it clattered to the floor. Eat your raspberries, Suki, so that I can clear the table. 
Mm, raspberries are too pretty to eat, Mother. I don't think I care for any. Nonsense, Suki. You haven't eaten enough to keep a canary alive. Mother began stacking plates and bowls for Suki's sisters to take to the kitchen. Daddy folded his napkin and looked straight at Suki. She was sure he was going to say the same thing Mother had said, but he fooled her. Did you know that peacocks like raspberries, Suki? Mother was making such a clatter she didn't hear, but of course Suki did, and an idea popped into her head like that. Mother, may I take my bowl of raspberries to my room? Yes, dear, just so you eat something. Suki tried not to hurry as she folded her napkin the way everyone else had and excused herself from the table. She pranced out of the room holding the bowl of berries high over her head and smiled triumphantly at Daddy. He smiled back. The invisible peacock waited patiently. From his perch on the limb outside Suki's window, he could see inside even though it was getting dark. Suddenly, a light went on, and there she was coming toward him. She set the bowl on the wide sill and raised the window as high as it would go. Did you think I was never coming, best friend? Supper took forever. But look at what I've brought you. They're fresh ones, too. Suki shook some of the berries out of the bowl into her hand. You must be starved. The peacock hadn't had a bite to eat all day, but he was too polite to gobble up the handful of berries the way he wanted to. Instead, he suggested... I want you to share them with me, Suki. They will taste better if you do. All right. Let's make up a game. I'll have one, then you. The last berry makes the winner. As the bowl emptied, they ate faster and faster until the very last raspberry was swallowed. Best friend is the winner. Three cheers for best friend. Both of them felt the hush the dark was bringing, and it quickly quieted them. Oh, this has been the loveliest day of my whole life. I don't want it to end. I know, said the invisible peacock. It is always that way with happy days. We never want them to end. But they seem to fly. It's the sad ones that drag by. Oh, you are wise, best friend. I have lived a long time, Suki. The years have taught me. You are a little girl, but I am 30 years old. Why, you're as old as my daddy. I never dreamed peacocks got to be as old as parents. Oh, yes. Peacocks often live to be 40. But if I should live to be that old, I know there will not be a lovelier day than this one. I shall always remember the way you understood when I told you how I felt at the zoo and the way you shared your paradise tree and the beautiful raspberries. That's the way it is with best friends. Good night. Good night, Suki. Suki opened her eyes, sleep of morning sun. Then she remembered best friends and raise the window with a bang. You wake me sooner. This is Saturday, and I don't have to go to school. We'll have the day all to ourselves. And what a perfect day, perfect spring day. Suki thought his voice sounded almost young, not nearly as raspish as yesterday. Why, he sounded happy. That's what it was. The touch of sadness was missing. Won't you have to help your mother today, Suki? Yes, some on errands, but that won't take long. This is a busy day in the shop, so it's better if I'm not around something I especially like to do on Saturdays. Such as? I don't think I'll tell you. <laughs> that way it'll be a surprise. Don't you love surprises? I do. If I were you, I wouldn't want to know. I'd rather be surprised. <laughs> All right. You surprise me. When will that be? I'll hurry with my room and have my breakfast. By the way, what do you like to eat besides raspberries? <laughs> Didn't we have fun last night playing eat the berries? Yes, yes, uh, that was a new game to me. Um, 
Well, now uh, let me think about what I'd like to... Visible Peacock closed his eyes and concentrated. Best friend, what peculiar eyes you have. Why, they don't close down like mine do. They close up. Your eyelids turn up from the bottom. Suki reached out and pulled the big bird's head close. Uh, it's a elastic, or I might lose my balance and slip off this limb. He pretended to steady himself. Uh, so you think my eyelids are different from yours? Uh, they are. They work just the opposite way from yours. Watch. I'll shut them very slowly. As I close my eyes, my eyelids come up. When I open my eyes, my eyelids go down. Suki was almost hypnotized. Do it again. Open, close. Open, close. Best friend, you know what? I always wake up, and you wake down. She was delighted with this discovery and kissed him impulsively on the top of his head. Quick, tell me what you like to eat. Well, um, greens. Any kind of greens. Uh, but my favorite is kale. Curly. Love curly kale, Suki interrupted. The peacock continued, A shell corn makes a good solid meal, and next to raspberries, I like worms for dessert. Worms? Ugh. Suki held her stomach. Oh, you won't have to bother with the worms. I'll find my own. But let's not waste any more time. You do your work, and I'll explore the yard. With that, the peacock dropped down to the limb below, then gracefully glided to the ground. Suki called, leaning much too far out the window. You'll like what we're going to do today. It was almost noon when they met again and started down the street together. So far, the invisible peacock knew where he was. This was the way they had gone to the school. But half a block further on, Suki turned into a narrow passage between two high apartment buildings. At the end of the passage stood four huge garbage cans, and once they had squeezed past them, they came out into an alley. Now, some city alleys are deserted and lonely, but this alley was bustling with activity. Along the other side of it, a whole block of old, worn-out buildings was being torn down. Piles of rubble, Bricks, stone, glass, shingles, discarded doors and rusty bathtubs, piles of rubble too high to see over, lined the alley. They had been made by a monster machine that swung an iron ball from a crane. The ball must have weighed tons and tons, and every time it thudded against one of those old walls, the bricks would crumble apart and fall to the ground. Try the noise was deafening. The clouds of dust and plaster were suffocating. But all the children in the neighborhood watched, spellbound, Saturday after Saturday. During school days, a guard kept them away, but he was off duty on weekends. It was a dangerous place, but after all, that was what made it so exciting. This is going to be the school playground when they get finished, Suki said to best friend above the noise. They had found a safe place between two piles of bricks that gave them a good view. Suki turned an old crate on its side, or a long visible peacock leaned against it, too. He didn't like the noise, but he wasn't going to spoil Suki's surprise. Finally, during a lull, he asked, Does your father know you come over here? Oh, yes. He brought me the first time. He brought my sisters, too. Of course, I, I have promised him to be very, very careful not to get close to the buildings. Goodness, if one of those walls toppled over on you, they might never find you. Her body shivered with horror, the kind of horror she enjoyed. Look, there's Butch and that mean gang of boys he's always playing with. The invisible peacock had seen them before Suki did, they were climbing the piles of rubble and throwing rocks at the windows and the walls still standing. One of the workmen in a steel helmet yelled at them. You know you're not supposed to be out here. Scram! All of you, beat it! Showing off as usual, Butch leaped down from the pile of bricks and began chasing another boy. They veered and headed straight for Suki sitting on the edge of the crate. 
Before she knew what was happening, the first boy jumped right over her, just missing her head. She knew Butch was going to try it, too. Suki crouched down, holding best friend tight against her as Butch sailed over them and landed ker-plunk on his sitter, all 110 pounds of him. Butch! Suki screamed, running to him. Did you hurt yourself, Butch? Don't touch me, the big boy growled. Tried to make me break my neck, didn't you, slant eyes? Well, it didn't work, see? He scrambled to his feet. The next time you get in my way, I'm going to take care of you, slant eyes, you understand? But shook his fist and acted like he was going to hit her. Suki was plenty scared, but she managed to say, I didn't make you fall, Butch. I, I didn't do anything to you, honest. And, and my best friend and I are sorry if you hurt yourself. What best friend? jeered Butch. My best friend, the peacock. I don't see no peacock. Maybe you don't, but I do, and he's staying in my paradise tree. Crazy loony, that's what you are, slant eyes. All girls are loony. And with that, Butch tore off to find his buddy. They would cause more trouble around the next corner, you could be sure of that. Come on, best friend, let's go home. I don't want to watch anymore. Suki shoved the crate away and kicked at a piece of old brick. The invisible peacock could tell she had hurt her toe on the brick, but he said nothing and followed her back through the narrow passage between the apartment buildings. When they reached the sunny street, he rearranged his feathers. Cheerfully, he said, It is still a beautiful afternoon, Suki. She didn't answer. It was as though she had forgotten he was there. I heard Butch call you slant eyes, he said, looking at her lovingly. When you laughed at my eyes this morning, I didn't get angry, did I? No, of course not, best friend, but I, I wasn't making fun of your eyes. I laughed because they were so different. Exactly, and that's what Butch thinks about yours. Tell me, Suki, do you like your eyes? Suki thought for a moment. Yes, I like my eyes. They're different looking because I'm Japanese American. Nisei, like Daddy says. But that's all right, isn't it? Is it all right for a peacock to have eyelids that close up instead of down like yours do? Is it all right for an Indian peacock to live in a tree in Chicago, Illinois, USA? Oh, yes. The point is, peacocks are peacocks. And people are people. Is that what you mean, best friend? Exactly. That's the most important thing to know. And Butch hasn't found it out yet. He's not the only one, I'm sorry to say. Lots of people act like differences are more important than being friends. I wonder if that's why they make up names like slant eyes. Exactly, said the peacock, using his favorite word again. The anger and fear inside Suki melted, and she wished she could think of a way to help Butch understand about people, the way the invisible peacock had helped her. Oh, you're right, best friend. It is still a beautiful afternoon. Let's go back and watch some more. Suki had just got the crate placed where she wanted it again, and best friend had just cozied down beside her when the monster ball and the monster steam shovel and the monster tractor suddenly went silent. It was as though someone pushed a button and turned them all off at once. The workmen took off their helmets and goggles and gloves. It was 12.30 Saturday and time to quit. When the workmen were gone, there was nothing more to see until Monday. Everyone who had been watching left, too. Everyone except Suki and best friend. They didn't budge. Suki mused, Poor old houses. Think of all the people they have kept warm. Now they have no windows, no doors, no chimneys, no roofs, just some walls. Don't they make you feel sad, best friend? Yes, Suki, they do, but... I like to think about the playground for all the school children that's going to be here one day, and then I'm not sad anymore. 
Look, somebody painted something on that old wall. That wasn't there last Saturday. Let's go see what it is, best friend. They got up and walked toward the wall. Big orange letters had been painted on it. Suki read, Danger, falling brick, keep away. Most of the wall had already toppled into a great gaping hole beside it that had once been a basement. Oh, we mustn't go any closer, best friend. It says danger. Listen, Suki. I thought I heard something down in that hole. They stood perfectly still and listened. There, I, I hear it too. Sounds like a groan. They inched closer. They heard it again, louder this time. Someone is groaning. Oh, I wish I dared get close enough to really look. I can, Suki. I can crane my long neck like a snake right over the edge. Don't you move, though. Carefully, the peacock looked down into the deep, dark trench the steam shovel had dug along the wall. Thick wooden beams had fallen across one end, and on top of them a section of the old wall, and it must have just happened because the dust was still fogging enough to make it hard to see. He could hear the groans plainly now. What do you see, best friend? Oh, someone is buried under the bricks, Suki. I, I can't see him, but he's groaning. He's hurt. Suddenly, bricks began rolling in all directions, and a boy's head appeared. Suki, it's Butch. It's Butch. Those old bricks tumbled in on him. We'll have to get help, Suki. Butch must have heard them because he tried to call. Suki, is that you? Suki, get me out of here. Suki and best friend could see Butch clearly now. He was working his shoulders and arms free. Perspiration poured down his dirty face from the effort, and there was blood on his T-shirt. I'll, I'll run home and get my daddy, Suki called. No, don't leave me, Suki. Just yell. Someone will hear you. Yell, Suki. Hurry. Suki was so weak with fear, she knew her voice would never attract anyone's attention. She tried to call, but she might as well have been whispering. And then she remembered how peacocks shout, and she pretended she was a peacock. Help! 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 It was a hair-raising, piercing cry. Help! 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 To Suki, her voice sounded magnified a thousand times. It echoed above the piles of rubble and brought people running from their houses. Help! 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 Suki never paused. Help! 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 A blue and white squad car squealed around the corner into the alley. It pulled up close to Suki, and a policeman jumped out. Stand back, he shouted at the people crowding around. What's going on here, little girl? Butch! Butch is down there. The wall fell on him. He's under the bricks! Daddy held the door of the automatic elevator open for Suki and the invisible peacock. Suki had not stopped talking all the way to the hospital, but once they entered the lobby, she was too busy looking at everything to say much. The big door clicked shut. Daddy pressed the button marked fourth floor, and they began floating upward. We've never visited anyone in the hospital before, have we, Daddy? No, Suki, but hospitals are wonderful places for sick people. This is the best place for Butch until they find out how seriously he was injured. Daddy had listened to every word Suki told him when she and best friend reached home after the accident. Even Mother seemed proud of Suki for helping to rescue Butch, and she suggested that Daddy bring Suki to the hospital to see him. Here we are, Daddy said as the elevator stopped and the door opened. To the left was a high counter, and behind it sat a nurse in her crisp uniform writing a report. Daddy said, pardon me, uh, we would like to see a boy named Butch. They told me at the main desk in the lobby you would know the room number. The nurse checked a list. Uh, that must be the boy they brought up from X-ray a while ago. He's in 411. The door of 411 was open. 
So they walked in. Butch was propped up in the hospital bed, his face as white as the pillows. But when he saw Suki, he smiled. It was the first time he had ever smiled at her. All she could think was, we're friends. Butch and I are friends. Daddy gave Suki a little nudge, then stepped back into the hall to wait. Suki walked across the room and stood beside the bed. Well, h- hello, Butch. Are you all right? Yes, Suki, thanks to you. And after the way I've treated you, too. Suki had never seen so much gratitude in a single look. She had never seen Butch's face so clean, either. She hadn't even noticed his freckles before. The only thing she could think of to say was, Will you have to stay in the hospital long, Butch? Well, the doctor didn't tell me, Suki. I, I guess I only have some bad bruises and a cracked rib. I heard him tell my uncle that I, I was the luckiest kid on the whole north side. Your uncle? Doesn't your mother know about the accident, Butch? Um, my mother is dead, Suki. I live with my uncle and spend vacations with Dad. Butch tried to turn over on his side, but it hurt too much. I didn't think the police or the ambulance would ever get there, did you, Butch? No, no, Suki, I sure didn't, but, boy, I I never heard anyone yell the way you did. The admiration in Butch's voice was too good to be true. It's a wonder the whole police force didn't show up. Oh, I, I couldn't have done it, Butch, without Best Friend. He helped me. Best Friend? What, what are you talking about, Suki? Butch frowned. He was trying so hard to figure out everything. Is Best Friend a joke or something? Oh, no, he isn't a joke at all. He's an invisible peacock, and he lives in our paradise tree, and he's the wisest and kindest creature in all the world, and he's my best friend. I want you to meet him, Butch. Yeah, if he's your best friend, I sure want to. Suki leaned down and said tenderly, Best friend, you said you loved me, and Butch too. You tell Butch, will you? Do you see him, Suki? Does he really talk to you? Butch asked in amazement. Oh, yes, Butch. My daddy says some things are real even if you can't see them. You are real, aren't you, best friend? And your love is real, real as sunlight. And you love me all the time, no matter where I am, no matter what I am doing, whether I'm good or whether I'm bad. Butch's face lit up. Is that the way love is, Suki? Exactly. Boy, boy, that's the way you make me feel. All full of sunlight. I do, Butch. Promising to come back to visit Butch soon, Suki waved goodbye from the doorway. She skipped up to Daddy, who was waiting in the corridor. As they entered the elevator, she said, Wait, Daddy, best friend's tail isn't in. Daddy smiled to himself and thought, What an imagination that child has. She's just like me. Aloud, he said, When we get home, Suki, I have a treat for you and best friend. Oh, well, tell us now, Daddy, what is it? A basket of curly kale, Daddy said. And they all laughed.